Welcome to Talk Jiu-Jitsu with hosts Uki Mike, Joey Breski, and me, Jordan Pressinger from Jordan Teaches Jiu-Jitsu. Today we have a great episode for you guys, and we'll start with Joey. Joey had a super fight uh, recently, and he also refed at a tournament uh, the same weekend of the super fight. So how did that go for you, Joey? Uh, it went pretty well. Uh, it's been a while since I refed, so a little rusty. Um, took a little while to get back into the groove, but I had a really good time, and things went well. I think I only fucked up one call over the two days, which was... Uh, you know, it, it sucks as a ref when you make a bad call and you know right away, but you explain it to the people, you apologize, you say, hey, I made a bad call. I'm sorry. It is what it is. Um, luckily, it didn't like actually change anything because the tournament had a round robin format. So the person I made the bad call against who should have won their match ended up winning gold anyway. So it kind of worked out in the end. It felt a little bit better about it. You know, no hard feelings. Um, the super fight went great. Uh, I ended up winning. Um, I got a heel hook, I think like three minutes into the match. It was a good match. The guy was good. Was he a black belt or yeah, what, what was yeah, he? Yeah. He was another black belt. Um, nice. yeah, we had a good match. You know, I, uh, he beat me by two points at a tournament, like three or four months ago when I blew out my shoulder and I don't know, I, I really wanted the match back. So it was, it was good for me to like get in there and do it. And the last time we fought, I really didn't do anything. I just kind of like gave up two points and then didn't move for the rest of the match. It was really disappointing. Uh, like I didn't play my game. So this time I kind of went out with like, whatever happens happens, but like play my game go. And I felt really good. I felt like I dominated the match from like the very start until the finish. And yeah, it was really nice to get that win. Um, a bunch of the guys from the team competed at the tournament too. And they all did well. I think we sent seven we had seven divisions so it was six people but one guy did gi and no gi uh and all seven meddled so that was really awesome um yeah i'm yeah, sorry i was gonna ask you like i couldn't watch the video great because uh long story but yeah my internet wasn't working for like a month in my house but so i could only like get like uh, a little bit of it so were you did he have you in a plata and then he transitioned to 50 50 and then went to the uh heel hook or what was the sequence there it was like uh I was trying to body lock pass and I kind of disengaged and he went for like a, one of those like Barada Plata things. I, I don't know, not a part of my game I'm super familiar with or like a Tarika Plata. It was more of just like, uh, he's holding on to my arm and it's just kind of stuck here, but like nothing's going to happen with this. Um, and then the moment like that kind of came undone, I like went for a, it's kind of weird because we were in like a half guardish position and I brought my outside leg over for like a reap onto the leg. Uh, and then he tried to scramble and I just ended up with a perfectly extended leg with the heel in my armpit. Yeah, it was a fast tap too. Like, uh, I mean, you're pretty lethal when you get in 50 50. So like, yeah, once you get there, um, people will be wise to tap and yeah. And you know, just to uh, expand on your experience, refing, making a mistake. I, uh, I refed a combatives tournament, which is for the military. And, uh, I did pretty good overall, I think, but, uh, yeah, I, I made a mistake too. And, uh, I didn't give someone passing points for they, they passed from half guard to mount, and I didn't, uh, I just gave them out points. I like, wasn't thinking in my head, oh yeah, there's a pass too. And he lost. And then they told me after, I'm like, shit, you're right. You know, he would have won if he had those points. So I, I felt really bad, but you know, the, you know, mistakes happen. And what's funny is that it, it was uh, Jake uh, who later moved to Trenton and, uh, and joined the gym. So I always felt bad that I screwed him at that tournament, but you know, shit happens for sure. So if a ref makes a call, can they, and you know it's instantly bad, can you not reverse it on the spot because you're in charge? Uh, depends what it is. So with points, I can go back and fix some points up. But like, let's say, so actually we'll use a good example. So um, I refed again this weekend. The super fight was two weekends ago. I refed again this past weekend at a different tournament in Calgary um, just because I wanted to. And it, it was a long day. Uh, last match of the day on my mat, uh, two white belts, they're going for ankle locks on each other. One guy's foot comes from the outside across the belly button. That's a re because you're holding the ankle. It's a DQ have to stop it to answer Mike's question. The moment I stop it, even if it was wrong, which in this case it wasn't, it was the right call. Uh, even if it was wrong, I cannot go back and undo that decision. The moment I say, stop, that's done. It's over. I stopped him. It is what it is. Um, in this particular case, the coach of the guy I DQ'd got, uh, very angry. 
um, had some nice words to say to me. Matt side was uh, questioning my call. And I'm like, listen, man, like it's a reap. The heel came across and he's going on about some nonsense that like, he's like, oh man, I've competed at finishers. I've competed at pans. I'm like, well, I don't, how does this mean you know the rules, man? He's like, oh, I know the rules. I'm like, well, no, obviously you don't. He ended up, they had someone videotape the match, shows me it. One, it's videotaped from like the other side of a barricade, so you can barely see. But even what you can see, I'm like, you can see that it's reaping. Like, I can see the reap on this video. And he's going off about something. I'm like, man, I was right on top of it. And then I kind of tried to concede like, hey, listen, even if it was wrong, like, I, it wasn't the wrong call. I'm sorry, your guy got DQ'd. It is what it is. Learn the rules. Make sure everyone knows them. But even if I was wrong, I can't undo it. So why are you arguing with me right now? Yeah. Plus the whole thing, if you you know you compete at finishers, this and that, that's just an appeal to authority. So that's a logical fallacy, and that's just a super like lame way to argue. And people do that a lot to me online. They're like, oh, blah blah blah. I said this. Like, oh, who cares? You know, it's like it, you can't use an argument of appeal of, to authority. Like you have to you have to argue the argument like your your point not just say oh this and that so yeah people people are so dumb like that you know like as a coach um and for you too joe i'm sure you experienced this like when refs make the wrong call it's definitely frustrating um seeing your student lose when they shouldn't have but at the same time it's like people make mistakes and that's just the way life goes and you know i've never gotten mad at a ref i've like um you know like question them like ask them and but like it's the the most important thing is to be polite to them understand that they're humans and you know refing is a very tough job like i refed um soccer for like a long time as a as a kid and man did people ever um just give me shit all the time it was like real like harassment you know and i wasn't a great ref so i kind of deserved it in a sense but like you know i was also just like a, a kid and i remember I was like, I think I was 15 or no, four, four, no, I was 13. And there's this, uh, like adult, uh, like probably 30 years old, big Jack dude trying to fight me. And like, they had to hold him back and hold me back. But like, bro, I'm like 13 years old. Like, what are you doing? And, you know, so some people are just so like lame that way. You just have to accept reality and move on. You know, you can't, you can't con change the things you can't control. So yeah, super lame when people are like that, but how does that make you feel? Is there like, were you like calm during it just like brushing it off or did it kind of get to you well actually like because it was the last match of the mat like i had the empty mat i actually tried to like i brought one of the table workers over and was like hey look this is what happened this is why i dq'd because you know uh, one thing i always hate like when you look at ibjf the refs will just dq they don't say a word they kick you off the mat and then there's no more discussion you know, I thought like, hey, maybe this is a good opportunity to try and like explain to someone like, hey, this is actually like the intricacy of the rules. So it was like uh, both guys went for an ankle lock flat on their back. Uh, outside leg comes across in like a single leg X position. So the toes of the guy were actually like in an okay spot, but the heel and ankle of his foot came across the belly button. So it, I don't care where your toes are in this position. I care where the rest of the foot and leg is. Once that crosses, it's the DQ. I thought maybe I'd explain it and he'd be like, okay, I get what you're saying, you know, whatever. I don't agree, but it is what it is. Uh, and his response was kind of like, listen, don't explain it to me unless like you want to get on the match with me. And like, I was like, what? Like, what are we going to fight to see if I undo a DQ? What? Like, come on, man. Don't be a clown. Yeah, man. Some immature people out there and they just kind of ruin it. You know, they kind of ruin people's experiences, especially when it's like kids. And I've seen just like coaches and parents just like uh, just making a big scene over over like it's just their kids competing, you know, I, like obviously you don't want them to have like an unjustified, you know, unjust experience. But, you know, you know, it, it's just is what it is. And it looks like in this case, it's not that you, you didn't even make a mistake. It was more like a subjective thing. And, um, you know, it, it, the way he viewed it, like it benefited his students. So obviously he's going to go with that narrative, but, uh, yeah, it's, that, that's pretty lame, but overall it was a good experience refing. Yeah. It was definitely fun to get back into it. Uh, I've always enjoyed refing. uh, you know, like as a coach, I was like, I'm hard on refs. Definitely. Uh, you know, I, I really believe that as a coach, it's your job to advocate for your athletes. So like, you know, if the ref misses two points, I'm the first guy going, Hey ref, there's two points. Like you got to give them two points where are like, let's give them that. But, uh, refing really definitely helps me understand the rules, uh, better. 
I like doing it. I like having these conversations with coaches, you know, when they go like, Hey, why'd you give the guy two points here? Or why didn't you? And, uh, I like to be the ref that after the match, like I'll explain why I did or didn't give points certain places, because I think that's how the rules are going to get better understood by people. Just like, I, for me, it's like my little way of like giving back to the community. As a, as a coach, do you ever try to influence the ref's uh, opinion? Because that's something I try to do all the time. All the and time. And I don't feel bad about it. It's just like, you know, for example, it's like, uh, you know, kind of subjective. If it's like a, if they should get points or not for a takedown or whatever it is, I'm like, oh, great takedown, great work. You know, you got, you got, you're getting your two points. And then kind of puts pressure on the ref to, uh, to do that. But then I also wonder sometimes, are they like, are they going to not want to do it in spite of, you know, just kind of spite me? Or if it's like a zero, zero and it's going to go down to a ref decision and be like, Oh, you dominated, you, you did great, you know, like uh, great work and, and stuff like that, you know, like, yeah, I try to like almost manipulate the ref in a way. But yeah, I don't know if you, if, uh, if you've done that, Joey, or if you experienced that as a ref all the time, uh, both sides of that, you know, like I'm, I'm always the guy going like, Hey, there should have been two points there. And the ref will look at me and shake their head. And I'm like, I know, man, I know, I know it should have been two points, but I got to try. Like, yeah, it's my athlete. I got to advocate for him. I got to try and get him to win. So if I can convince a ref that, you know, something that started from a turtle could have been a sweep. Cool. I'll take two points where I can get them. Um, is it the most ethical way of coaching? Maybe not, but you know, it's all in good spirit and the ref makes the decision. Like that's kind of not my fault anymore for the ref making a mistake. But, uh, you know, I have the same thing as a ref, like, I had one the other day where a guy, it was like a turtle kind of rolled him over and the ref or the coach was going three points for a pass. And I kind of like stopped and I was like, that's not a pass. And I like looked at him and I shook my head and he's like, yeah, yeah. it's not, but I'm trying, yeah. I'm trying to get my part, my <laughs> kid boy. And so I was like, all right, well, I respect the hustle. Yeah. I mean, you got to do what you got to do. I mean, you want to see your students win and it's not like um, cheating, you know, it's just like do your best to kind of, yeah, game the system, I guess. But yeah, it is what it is. I think every coach does that. And uh, yeah, I don't think it's wrong. But uh, yeah, a couple of exciting uh, pieces of news. Uh, Mike is promoted to Purple Belt. He's a Purple Belt now. So congratulations, Mike. Thank you very much. It's been a long, uh, a long time, not a long time, it's been a long time <laughs> since I've achieved it, something that I've tried to achieve, like a goal like that. That's what I meant. Yeah, I mean, that's like a pretty uh, major, I think the purple belt is like the most major belt you can get in the sense of like, um, you know, blue is great. I think everyone should strive to get their blue belts and that's a huge accomplishment. But I feel like purple is like when you really, uh, it's kind of like, you know, you're a serious grappler, you know, you've, you've stuck in it for years and, uh, you know, you got great technique or most purple belts should, you know, Mike does. And uh, yeah, we, you know, it happened a couple of weeks ago and um, we did a podcast that I just felt like, you know, it just was like, I felt really low energy. It wasn't a great, um, I don't know. I just like, so I'll do this all the time. If I don't like, like something perfectly, I won't use it. So I feel bad because that was actually the episode we haven't talked about it. So now I feel bad. I forgot at the time, but uh, yeah. So congratulations to Mike. Thank he you. also, uh, do you have any other exciting news? Uh, yeah, I'm engaged now. So that's huge for me. Uh, I go from not dating anybody for seven years and now I'm engaged after a month of knowing uh, uh, actually the woman of my dreams, to be honest with you. So yeah that's, yeah, that's super exciting. And like I said, in the last podcast, didn't get used that, uh, you know, sometimes you just know, and a great, um, a great example and story I like to share, I'm sure I've talked about on the podcast is that uh, in the past that, you know, I started dating Nikki when I was 12 years old, she was 13. So yeah, I was a preteen, she was a teen. And, uh, you know, she, I just like, I liked her differently. Like I could just feel like I, I could just feel like I liked her different from the other girls and you know, why did I feel different? Cause it was love. And, uh, you know, we're still together now, 20 years later today, uh, this year is going to be our 20 year anniversary and we're only 32. So that's, uh, pretty crazy really. I mean, I don't know anyone else has been together that long and, uh, yeah, but like I said, when you know, you know, and what's really cool too, is like in the past we were, um, like right away, we were already talking about what our kids' names are going to be and stuff like that and, and planning all that stuff. We never used any of the names, uh, for actual kids, but it was just cool to, um, yeah, to kind of do that <laughs> at like 12 years old. Oh yeah. Like I go from four years ago where I'm addicted to opiates. I'm, uh, sleeping 20 hours a day, pretty much, pretty much a bum for lack of a better term. 
and to I have a purple belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and I'm engaged to be married to the most beautiful, amazing woman I've ever met in my life. And yeah, so I guess and the message is anybody that's uh, down in life right now, shit can flip on a dime. You never know when your life can do a 180 and get way, way better. Yeah, I think that's the best like uh, moral of the story is that like if you like when you feel dark times, uh, there are going to be great times coming and doesn't feel like that at the time when you're when you're feeling like that. But it's just, you know, that's just like you just need to look forward to the good and the good will come. You know, I've been I've been there many times just super depressed and feeling so down. But then like something happens or just get out of that funk. I'm just feeling great. I'm thinking like, you know, um, you know, like I wish I knew I could feel as good when I was feeling so down because, you know, then I wouldn't, maybe I wouldn't feel as down. So it's like, you have to, um, you know, endure the bad and then, you know, savor the good because life is so much like ups and downs. So yeah, I'm really happy for you, Mike. Thank yeah, you. a lot of great things coming your way. Purple yes. belts. Uh, yeah, engaged. And you've met her. She's awesome. She comes and watches at the gym all the time. She's really personable. She's super nice. I'm amazing. I, could, I couldn't meet a nicer person. Yeah, when, Wendy is really nice. And uh, yeah, one thing I wanted to talk about too, uh, you're going to see it soon, Joey, if you if you want to watch it. But I did we did a challenge video where um, I roll blindfolded with 10 students for two minutes each. And if they guess, uh, if I guess incorrectly who I was rolling with, I need to give them $100. And if they submit me during that time, they get $1,000. So pretty expensive challenge to put on but like uh you know thank god for sponsors magic spoon sponsored it and um but uh yeah like I, the way we did it was like like if two people submit me they get 500 each three people then you know 333.33 each so like i didn't have to give out thousand dollars to all these people but no one got me anyways um yeah i was still undefeated on youtube of like not getting submitted so yeah well will your video come out before this yeah, it's probably coming out to, uh, today. I got to do a couple of quick uh, changes, but yeah, it's coming out today. So I uh, hope everyone listening enjoyed it because yeah, you know, I really like doing stuff like this. Like this, that's this is the kind of stuff that gets me like uh, you know fired up. And like I, I really like editing it too. I think that um, yeah, like it's just like it just kind of breaks it up. All the other stuff I do to do something different. So yeah, I'm really excited for that. And yeah, I like uh, for people to see it and rolling blindfolded. It didn't really affect me too much, like, uh, which I didn't expect it to because it's all like muscle memory. And it, the, the hardest part is when you don't have grips on people, you're not connected on them. And, or if they try to take advantage of, um, they try to take advantage of like, uh, like their start. So people, they, they go around you one person like Jeff did, he just like walked around me and took my back and uh that was a good strategy which i surprised more people didn't take that yeah, strategy too. you know like yeah i don't know like that would be my first thought is like just like walk around them but uh only jeff thought of that but uh yeah a pretty good uh pretty good challenge and uh yeah i don't know i just want to mention that yeah, it was really I, fun to watch it was sorry joy it was really fun to watch everybody's strategy and what they did and we game planned things that you know when people watch it they'll see in the video <clears throat> And uh, to try to trick Jordan, we had whole like uh, conversations and chats set up how we're going to trick him, but uh, nobody, nobody got that bag. So, well, but you did trick me though, because what Mike did was he gave another student uh, his wrist brace, which made me think that it was him, that it was Mike. Uh, in the video, I'm like, uh, it's Mike, you know, Mike, Mike's got a wrist problem. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, it turned out it wasn't Mike, it was Andrew. And same thing with um, Tyler. Tyler. Yeah, Mike gave him his knee brace. And so I was thinking, like, who has a knee brace? Because, yeah, not that many people do have knee, uh, knee braces or knee problems for the most part. So I couldn't figure out who it was. So that was a good, um, but either way, I didn't know who it was. So, yeah, that was a pretty smart strategy. But, yeah, it was, it was a good time. That's really clever to give the braces so that it doesn't give away who it is. That's, that's actually really clever. What I was most curious to see is like how you started the rounds, because like, like you said, you know, I've tried things where you roll like with your eyes closed or without grips. And like, I always found the hardest part was just the initial, like trying to get connections. Cause I can't see where your damn arm is. Yeah. I mean, we just started always in my guard because I thought that would be like, uh, it's just open guard. I thought that'd be the safest because I worried, okay, takedowns are going to be very dangerous, but even passing, like if I don't know where to grab and stuff and people are like, like kick me in the face by accident. So it'd be, I knew it'd be safer to start and guard and then sweep. And then I would already be connected to them and, and not have to like figure out where the grips are. So yeah, it turned out to be a great challenge for you. I think people are going to find it uh, pretty funny. And like one thing I think, I don't know if people are going to like, 
some people always interpret things wrong. And I don't really worry about this because again, I'm not going to talk about negative comments or stuff like that. But like, I wonder if people are going to think I'm an asshole. Some people just because like throughout the thing, I was like very confident and, uh, you know, just kind of talking shit back. Like you're not going to get me and stuff like that. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. It doesn't matter if they say that, but I'm just curious if, if they are going to say that. I felt bad for you at the end of every tap because you'd have your hand stuck out like this to, to, you know, slap and bump and they just leave you hanging most of the time. So I felt bad. Yeah. Like, well, Jordan probably feels, I felt sad for Jordan there. Like guys, I can't see you. <laughs> you guys can see me, but actually the weirdest experience, uh, part of the whole thing was just uh, not being able to see for so long. Like before we even started and we put the blindfold on, I already felt like kind of like anxious, like um, it just felt really strange. Um, yeah, not be not having that sense to you, and then having like uh, being like thirty minutes, thirty minutes blindfolded, like around that. Um, it was really weird. It was it it almost felt like a dream, a dream almost. Like it felt uh, not like normal, like reality. It, it, it was really strange. And I didn't because I did also didn't know where I was within like the mat space. For some reason, I always thought I was in the middle. Like I never even clued in that like I could be close to other people. And then I watched the back and like multiple times were like really close and people got to move and yeah. stuff like that. But yeah, it's weird to kind of goes through your head um, when you, when you lose a sense like that. And one strategy I had was try, try to listen to their breathing. Cause uh, some people have like distinctive um, you, you can hear their voice almost in their breath. So a couple of people I could identify based off their breath and uh, one person I could identify based off their smell, like their scent, they didn't smell bad, which I say in the video, like they don't smell bad, but you could just kind of, some people have like a distinctive scent. So yeah, I thought it was pretty cool. You can kind of use your other senses to, uh, to help you out and, and, and identify. But, um, yeah, I want to think of more challenge videos like that. It's just hard, you know, like as soon as we thought of that challenge video, we like went like on it, like so quickly, okay, let's plan this. Let's, uh, let's do it. But it's just hard to think of these kind of things. So yeah. At any point, could you see, like, did the blindfold slip down you had to adjust or was it all? Cause that's what we were worried about the most. Well, I taped it really good. Like I, I, I think I taped it too tight almost, uh, cause it, it was putting a lot of pressure in my head, but no, there's only one moment where I saw the like, glimpse of light. Um, but I couldn't see shit because my eyes like weren't adjusted. Yeah. So like, it didn't matter. I just pull it back down really quick. It only, it only came up like a tiny bit, but no, through the whole match, the, or, or the whole event, it uh, it held up really good. And, uh, yeah, like <laughs> shit, it was a, it was a great experience. Yeah, it was really fun to watch. Support for Talk Jitsu is brought to you by Manscaped, who's the best in men's blow the waist grooming. Their products are precision engineered tools for your family jewels. Manscaped Performance Package is the ultimate men's hygiene bundle. Join over 7 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you. 20% off and free worldwide shipping with the code JTJ at manscaped.com. If my math is correct, that's about 14 million balls. So what's your experience been with uh, Manscaped? Well, I've used probably a half a dozen different na name brand products before, and they're terrible. I've cut myself every time. And these are very expensive, very well-named brand products. And with Manscaped, I've never cut myself. Exactly. And you know what I like the most about uh, the Manscaped Razor is it has a flashlight on it. And you oh, think, that's the best. It's amazing. You think that, oh, it's just this like, you know, feature or whatever, but actually it's kind of like... Uh, when you've experienced a light uh, a light on your razor you may, it makes you wonder why no other ones have that too because this is a game changer you can just see everything so much easier you know even if you don't have the perfect lighting so that was my that was my favorite aspect of it i was actually shocked how uh how, how much better it made too because i was you know doing my neckline and everything so oh, I, I can actually see where the line should be right because there's a light it's so simple and so smart so i really like that from manscaped 100 percent. i thought is this a gimmick and then i tried it i was like no this is this is the way it's the only razor i've ever had that has a light on it and it really <laughs> lights the way to to the way to shaving your balls it does it makes all the difference i think a lot of uh, other brands are maybe more towards like your hair or just your beard or something right but this is like the full package so yeah. uh, guys jtj at checkout let's go and uh yeah what else i want to talk about yeah w one thing that's interesting um i wanted to mention is that i was talking to someone about inside position um and I and they mentioned that Danahar says that uh, actually let me get your opinion first before before I even say uh, say it because I want to see if we disagree here. Uh, do you think that close guard is inside position or do you think it's outside position for the person it's playing the closed guard? Yeah, I've honestly never really thought of it. I mean, just the guard itself, like just the legs wrapping, I would 
probably call an outside position, but you are technically like if you climb your legs up, you have access to the insides of the armpits with the legs. That's not really preventable. So I, I, I you know what? I'm going to be wishy-washy here and say I could see an argument for either case, but I'm curious to see uh, how like you justify your thoughts and how Danaher justifies his, because I, I think I could be persuaded either way here. Yeah. So I think I can persuade you because I've already talked to a couple other people that, uh, that I regard their opinion pretty highly and, and they're like well-known people, like decently well-known, but I'm not going to name drop like, you know, and then talk about our conversation. But yeah. So Danahar says that close guard is, uh, is outside position. But to me, that doesn't make any sense because if, if like, yeah, you're kind of wrapping like from the outside, but same thing with an underhook, right? Like that, if if uh, if your legs are i i view um close guard like your legs similar to your arms like there was there's no difference right so if i'm using my arms for a body lock that's inside position if i use my um you know or you know so like uh, okay I, I have so many thoughts in my head so in mounts when you have your legs over top of their hips that's inside position uh from the back if you have a body triangle that's a that's inside position and it, you know, body lock too, it's inside position. So like the, it's inside position between the knee and, and the armpit, right? Like if you put your knee to elbow together, all the space like um, that's inside of that is inside position. So in close guard, the, t the top player has inside position on the legs, but the bottom player is inside position on the torso. So to, to control someone, you need to control either their torso or their head primarily. And when you control the legs, you often control the, the torso, like the lower part. So yeah, it's one of these situations where they both have inside position, but to me, uh, the torso is more important inside position. It's the most important inside position. Um, and that's why the person that's in the bottom close guard has a little more of an advantage. They both have some inside position, but the, the, it's the bottom player has as the more like has more and it's often not you know it's it's often not like uh inside position or not it's often like a spectrum of who has more so for example like um and like a like a underhook is inside position but so is it an overhook it wraps around from the outside in to take inside position if you don't take the overhook you don't have any inside position and uh you know that's not a good idea right so yeah, close guard um, to me is a great example of inside position, um, and I don't see an argument for it being on the outside. Like you're controlling, the, you're controlling their hips, and uh, that's an important aspect of inside position. For me, I think like it would depend. A, like I could see an argument for it being outside position if you let the guy on top maybe get like uh, chest to chest and have both underhooks or something, and like that case i could see like it's pretty hard to say your inside position when he has both underhooks and his chest to chest and it's working like uh like a good example would be like if someone goes for like a sao paulo pass style of thing like i think that would be definitely like an inside position for the guy on top uh, yeah sorry joe i don't mean to cut you off but i want to i just want to expand on that so yeah, that is inside position, but it's with your arms, right? So you can take less or more inside position. And when you're in close guard, uh, whoever has it, whoever has inside position with their arms is going to have the most inside position now. So like, yeah, if you're on the uh, top, you have inside position on the legs with your legs. And then to pass or do anything, uh, you want to take inside position, like a Sao Paulo pass on their arms. So you take an underhook or, or whatever it is. And same thing on the bottom, you have inside position with your legs on their torso. And then when you take inside position with your arms on their arms, that's when you start attacking Kimuras or whatever it is. Like, like a triangle is inside position between the ear and shoulder because there's different parts of inside position, right? But it still, it comes from the outside in a sense, just like uh, your legs would on the torso. Yeah, it, I definitely agree that like there are different places to have inside position and different ones that matter. And like, uh, you know, if we're being honest, like certain inside positions in certain scenarios are pretty useless. Like, for example, if someone has a triangle and you like getting an underhook on their arm, like, yes, you have a bit of inside position, but his inside position that's strangling you uh, trumps that. Like, it's more important. Yours is now not the most useful functional piece of grappling. So, like, I think for close guard, it really depends on, like, what's going on. If it's just, like a close guard, the guy in the guard has posture. I think the guy on bottom has the inside position because he has access to the armpits easily with the legs. He has access to the upper body. He has the control here. 
but I don't even think it needs to be above the armpits because to control someone, uh, their whole body, you need to control their upper body and their lower body. So for example, when you have the back, like you can, yeah, you, you, you're taking a seatbelt grip that's on their upper body of inside position between the ear and shoulder, the armpit and the hip, and then you use your legs to control them even more so of, of their hips. Right. So I think that, uh, yeah, I just, I just don't see in any realm of possibility how a uh, closed guard can be outside position. And, you know, so I'm, yeah, I'm saying Danahar is wrong, but I hope people don't jump on me and like, you know, try to like get their pitchforks out. Cause I know people are very, um, people love Danahar, but like, I just think that he hasn't thought this through, uh, fully of like, why would it be outside? And, um, the, the problem with inside position is that no one's really defined it. So what I did in my theory course was I defined it and it's the same thing with my YouTube video that I post about inside position because I was trying to find like what do other people think inside position is. And I just started thinking about it a lot more. Like, how do I define this? And to me, it's everything um, above your elbows and everything above your knees because you use what's in front of your elbows and in front of your knees, for example, our forearms to uh, prevent inside position. Once you get past the elbow, you take an inside position. Once you get past the knee, you take an inside position. So that's another reason why, um, you know, it's less inside position for the person on top of closed guard because, they, yeah, they're controlling the inside space of your legs, but they haven't gone past your knees. And what happens when they get past the knees? You control the torso, right? And this, which is what they have for control for the person on the bottom. They have control of your torso. The torso and, and neck are the most important aspects of inside position. So, yeah. So, again, everything above your knee, knees, everything above your elbows, and everything below your chin is inside position to me as well as everything in front of your torso. So like that's more I consider inside space, which can be used interchangeably with inside position, but more so it's like the inside space. So you uh, take the inside space, you can take the inside position, which is again, their torso and uh, yeah, and above their knees, above their elbows. That's, I think you raise a good point about like defining it because I definitely like hearing your definition. I think we had slightly different definitions of what would define like inside position and I, th I wonder if maybe like Danaher's take on the inside outside position is just a different use of the term, like a different definition for it internally, because you're right. There isn't one like standard universal, like, you know, if we say like a rear naked choke, like everyone kind of knows what a rear naked choke is. It kind of has a universal definition, but something like inside position doesn't. So how do you define, how do you define inside position? Uh, for me, it's basically like... <sighs> I've never really thought about how to define it in terms, but when I explain it to my students when we're rolling is uh, usually who's closer to the midline of the body. Um, so like uh, a good example is like if we're wrestling and we're both trying to take collar ties, if my collar tie is inside yours, so closer to your sternum, like to the medial part of your body, I have the inside position with my collar tie. Uh, if I have a bicep grip, my hands on your bicep, your forearms on the outside of my arm, I'm closer to your center line. Same thing with underhooks. If my arm is on the inside, so in your armpit, closer to your middle line, I have the inside position. Uh, and it, it works in like, you have to change it a little bit when you start getting things like, uh, you know, hips and legs, because we're now we're not necessarily talking about like the sternum, but am I closer to the middle of the body, the center of the body? Yeah, I think we have some similarities there, but um, it, it's definitely similar. It's just there. I can see little tiny, maybe like little individual, like really specific positions where you could debate one or the other based on some semantics about the definitions. Well, let, let's put the, let's look at why I say it's above the elbows and above and above the knees. Uh, so when you're passing in half guard, when you get past the person's knee with your outside knee, you take an inside position because now you control their thigh as opposed to being behind their shin. And that's a huge gain in um, position, right? You get past the knee now you're way, it's way easier to put them on their back and control them. And uh, same thing for like uh, escaping submissions. So like if you escape, uh, you, you say you're in a knee bar and you clear the knee line, it's because you've cleared their inside position. They don't no longer have inside position because they're past your knee now. Same thing with the arm bar. You bring your elbow out of there. Well, now they're in front of your frame and they don't have inside position. So, um, yeah, I think that my definition, is, <laughs> I think it's the best one because it just, it, I, it just makes so much sense. Like, uh, yeah, I thought about this so much and, uh, I think the, yeah, you have, we have some similarities, but 
yeah, the issue is like, why, like, why the sternum? Like, why, um, yeah, why, why the sternum? Uh, usually, like, the sternum is just an example. For me, it's like the center of the mass. Like, uh, you know, for most of your examples, too, like an underhook is inside position because I'm closer to the center of your body. I control, like, uh, you know, if there was like a, I'm trying to think of a good way to explain this for the people who aren't watching the video, which also I'm not explaining well, but if you hold your like elbow up at 90 degrees with your body, that little triangle between your elbow and like your rib cage, that is the inside position because whoever's there is closer to the sternum. So if I'm on bottom or fighting and I can keep my elbows pinned to my rib, you can't get closer with your elbows to my sternum than I am. Obviously my elbows are pinned to my ribs. Like you can't get tighter to my body than literally touching my body. So I will have the inside position by default here. Uh, I, I think like, I definitely haven't defined it as much. I know when I teach it, it, I borrow a lot from the way you've taught it on your theory course with, you know, explaining how to get it and where to go. I think my definition of, uh, inside position just has a couple little differences. Um, mostly just pulled from like weird stuff I do that maybe doesn't jive with normal ways people would do or consider inside position. Um, yeah, I do some, like anyone who's rolled with me knows I do some really weird stuff. So yeah, you have a weird style for sure. Yeah. Not in a bad way, but just definitely uh, different. But yeah, like um, it's like you're saying, um, you know, certain things that I agree with hundred percent, but I think that your definition Again, people want to hear us argue anyways, right? So not always agree. So yeah, let's keep on this. It's like, you know, like an underhook is more so it's inside position because it's controlling the torso. Like the torso is the what is what you want to control. And the more inside position you have, the better. So like if you um it's on a spectrum. So like elbows tight, you can't let someone get inside position on your upper body. And as they start to get uh, underhooks and whatnot you're getting more and more and the more jacked up your arm is uh once it once your elbow goes past your shoulder that's when it's most isolated so like arm triangles for example or like an arm bar your your legs are controlling the space between the ear and the shoulder and the armpit and the hip right so um that's uh, a great example of inside position again controlling the torso same with the triangle ear and shoulder armpit and hip same with dars uh, uh armpit and hip and i don't think some people try to define it as like only above the elbow as if the hips don't matter but uh hip control matters uh, a lot if people can move their hips then they can uh get out and i think the close guard example is a great example too of like who's going to be in better control there when they both have um, inside position on each other just in different ways? Well, it's going to be who controls the hips because if you can move your hips out from the bottom position, you can start getting angles, start going for all sorts of submissions and whatnot, sweeps. If you can't move your hips, um, you probably can't do much offense from there. And same thing as the person on the top to pass, you need to, uh, it's hard to do if, if your hips are controlled. If you can stand up, then your hips aren't uh, controlled great. But at the same time, um, yeah, if they get inside position on your arms, then they can not, they can kind of negate that a little bit. But um, yeah, like another example is like if you're going for like a leg lock from top close guard, right? You can't go for it if they have their legs locked up because they're controlling your torso. And then if if you break that grip, well, now you can go for a leg lock or same thing with passing. You need to get their control off of you. And I don't see how outside position can control you uh, that well. Like, I don't know how you can, how anyone can define it as outside position when it's control of the hips and the, and the torso and everything. So, yeah, I don't know. Hopefully I made a good case for it. Um, because, yeah, just in my opinion, I, well, obviously, like, I think that my definition should be the the standard for inside position. Because, again, no one has defined it. I tried to look at so many things and... Like, why can't anyone define it? You know, it just doesn't make any sense to me. It's such an important concept, but people have all these, like, they speak in like, uh, like, like riddles almost, but they, but just, you know, I like this clear definition of the, of the, tor of, yeah, above the knees, above the elbows, above the chin. Most important part is the torso itself. And, uh, yeah. So Danahar's wrong in my opinion, but you know, like, uh, yeah, I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to sound like I'm talking shit at all. Like I, I respect Danahar, great instructor, great coach. And, um, but you know, this is also why I call it jujitsu theory because I'm willing to admit I'm wrong if anyone presents me with information or, uh, or a, um, yeah, just a conclusion that's different from mine because that's like, you know, science, right? You know, you, you, um, you, yeah, whatever doesn't work, you take out and, and, and you figure out what's right. So, yeah, um, 
Yeah, that's what, it. What got you going down this road about that? Was it the lack of information that was out there and you wanted to be the definition of this? Like you wanted to define it for yourself and help other people or like what got you down this road? Yeah, I know. So like I just I just really started making a lot of conclusions and thinking about it um, just because like, I don't know, that's what I spend my time doing sometimes just like figuring out like, oh, you know, why is it this way? Why is it that way? And like, it's just frustrating for me when people can't get, can't give like clear answers. Um, it's always has been, which I figure, which I think is a huge problem in jiu-jitsu. People, um, they, they make things very murky, right? And I like to make things really clear. And I think, you know, I think that uh, I think very objectively where like um, I'm just very good at like cutting through like the bullshit and figuring out what's the truth. So like, um, yeah, I started thinking like um, about all these things and started putting together, okay, um, all these like different theories I have of like, for example, one thing is like layers of defense. So like your first layer is your hands and then your second layer is your elbows or for your arms and then for your legs your first layer is your feet and the second layer is your knees and everything past the second layer is inside positions and it, it, the theory holds true uh in every situation you could think of so like when you're wrestling uh your hands are your first level of defense so if they get past your hands then you must use your your elbow and forearm to frame to stop them from getting closer if they get past your elbow then they've taken inside position they've taken under, an underhook or if you've underhooked them your overhook is also inside position but less but doesn't always mean that it's worse it just um well you could debate if an overhook or underhook is worse but i don't think that either one is but i think they're have their both, both have their utilities but it's the same thing for like um you know your guard so like uh when i was rolling with that judo guy who was really big and he was like probably 232 uh, yeah, i around 230 pounds or maybe like i don't know 220 but uh you know i knew that I would be in the best position defensively to have my feet in front of him because that'll stop him from being able to put his weight on me, right? Whereas if it was only my knees, you know, I, it's just less defense than your feet. And same thing with like when you're passing, like it's more defensive to be on your feet than it is to be on your knees. And But the problem is, well, not necessarily a problem, but uh, kind of where it gets kind of like, I don't know what the word to use is, but like you need to get on your knees at some point because you need to get chest to chest. Like the goal of passing is to get chest to chest, either like chest to, uh, uh, sorry, not chest to chest, chest to torso. You either want to go chest to chest or chest to back when you're passing because what are the other options, right? You want to either go side control mounts, which are both chest to chest, or you want to go to the back, which is chest to back, right? And to get there, you need to get on your knees. Uh, well, not for the back necessarily, but like mounts and side control, eventually you get to your knees, but like being on your knees to pass without adequate grips, you're going to get, um, swept easily. Right. So it's more defensive to be on your feet. Um, but it's less offensive to be on your feet. And, and, and because, um, it, like you, you're, you're further away with your torso to control their torso. So all these things I've been thinking about so much and just trying to poke holes in every theory I have, because, you know, I know if I, if, if I can find holes then other people can, and if I can't find holes and I don't think that the people are going to be able to either, because I don't think there are holes because I just think about it so much. So yeah, that's like, uh, you know, I, that might be a good advertisement for this, for the theory course, because like all this stuff is in it and, and more. So you view it as a spectrum or degrees rather than a definite yes or no for inside position. Yeah, well, no, it's Somebody, because what I, I don't know, maybe I'm not listening right, but what I got from it was they can both have inside position, but one has more and one has less. So it's different degrees of inside and outside position. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. that's exactly it. It's it's both. I think uh, inside position can be clearly defined, but it, it can also be um, like, yeah, it's a spectrum of who has more. And that's really what it is. Again, overhook, underhook, there's more or less. In close guard, you have uh, less, in a sense, from the person on top, in my, in my opinion. And uh, yeah, the, the best example is an arm triangle, like I talked about earlier. It's again, so like when you get the elbow uh, in line with the shoulder, you've taken a lot of inside position. But once you jacked it up even higher, then you've really taken a lot of inside position because now you're like, you have everything uh, like controlling the torso. And uh, yeah, same thing with an arm bar. This is a great example too. If if you're close to the elbow, um, then they're, it's going to be harder to finish because you have less uh, breaking force and you have less um, ability to control their head and their torso. And the closer you are to their torso and head, the more inside position you have and the further away you are from their layer two of defense, which is their elbow. So yeah, it's uh, that's it. <laughs> 
I think there's an interesting one about the arm triangle there when you were saying like when the arm comes up, it's more inside position. And I had someone the other day when I was trying to teach it say, well, uh, when you bring the arm up, you're taking away that space between the neck and the shoulder. So you don't have inside position on that space because their shoulders touching their neck. And what I thought was really interesting about that is it kind of made me think like, I don't necessarily have to have my own body parts in the inside position to control it. I just need to have control of it. So like another example would be like, uh, if we were in side control and I passed your lapel under your armpit behind your back to my hand. Well, I have complete control of the inside position on that side from the lapel. No part of my body is actually on that side of your body but I'm completely controlling it. So there are definitely times where you can have an inside position without even having your body necessarily in that position. And that's where I think like my definition needs a little bit of work because like, you know, to control that armpit in my definition, you would have to be in that armpit. But if I just pass that lapel underneath, I'm functionally controlling the inside position without being there. Yeah. Let me give another example because that's a great point you brought up. So like I like, so the way I think of, um, uh, like side control and, uh, or or let's do, let's do back the back first. So when you have someone's back, it's like your chest is the seat of a car of a car. And then your arms are the seatbelts and then your legs are the waist straps. So like your, um, chest is the, is the seat, right? And then, but if you're, if you have someone in mounts or you have someone in side control, your chest is the seat, but it's in front of them. But the thing is the mat is also taking inside position on them. So like the reason why you want to put someone on their back is so that their back, their their inside position, their torso is controlled by the mat and you. So if you, if the person gets on their side, you'll have less uh, control of their torso of your own chest and then less of their back uh, being controlled by the mat. So then that's when things start to go bad, which is such a great example of the importance of pinning people on their back. So, um, yeah, I agree hundred percent. It's not always, you don't even always need to position yourself in an inside position to control someone. You can position the mats or like, like you said, like their own uh, body. And another great example, because I, I actually, I love talking about this kind of stuff. It's like, um, okay. Like choke bites, choke bites are a great example of the more inside position you have, the better, because if there's a say arm triangle, for example, uh, if there's a gap between your, um, your bicep and your, uh, forearm and like, like where your inner elbow is, then you don't have a good choke bite. The closer you are, uh, to their neck wrapped around their neck. So there's no space. You've taken more inside position, more control of the torso and neck. And then that's when you get your, the, the best chokes and same thing with the triangle or everything. If there's a gap, you have less inside position. So you need to close that space and, uh, take more inside position, the more you have, the better. Yeah. I I think Mike was, you know, like when you asked earlier, is it like a sliding scale necessarily of like inside position? I would definitely agree with that. Like, I think there are, you know, you can have like 60% inside position control or like 50% or 80 or a hundred. I do think like there are levels to inside position. I don't think it's something that you either have or don't have necessarily. Uh, Yeah. Sorry, another great example. If you have an underhook, okay, that's inside position. Once you get your shoulder underneath their armpit, you have even more. It's a deeper underhook. You've taken more inside position. So like there's 100% a spectrum. You have a decent, like a decent underhook. It's like, it might not even be decent if it's not uh, deep enough, but, or you could have a really deep underhook by getting more inside position. So I think that's where people kind of go wrong is not understanding the spectrum of it. And they try to think of it too black and white which I don't know if like uh, Danahar did in this case of uh, closed guard or he just has a different definition than I do. But um, yeah, I still, I just can't see an argument for why it'd be outside position. I just don't understand. Yeah, so did you guys see the the world, the IBJJF World Championships? And uh, what I thought was really interesting was um, the Rotolo, uh, I, don't, I don't know if it was both, no, just one of them. He, uh, he lost to uh, something... Gomez, I don't know his first name. Uh, and then, Jansen. Jansen. Yeah, Gomez. Jansen Gomez. And he also beat um, Tynan Dalpra. Yep. Man, I'm, I'm actually pretty good with my names today. <laughs> but uh, yeah, okay. I think this is really interesting because a lot of people, they just, they put people on the pedestal, which like they just view them so high and oh, they can't lose, something like that. And I think that that can happen. Oh, it just happens all the time, 100%. But like, I think that happened a bit with the Rutolos where like people just view them as like so amazing and they are, definitely they are. 
but there's also other amazing people out there very, that are very good at jiu-jitsu and you know just because they they're doing well in competition uh doesn't mean they can't be beaten right so i thought that was a really, really interesting thing to kind of see like who people kind of view as like the new guard the new like upcoming like go, uh, greatest of all times almost like, i'm sure some people have that opinion you know lose to someone that's a little lesser known he's not like not well known he's a he's a great competitor that's uh, well known within the competition scene but like yeah you just you can't just uh, assume someone's going to beat someone else there's a lot of great practitioners out there but yeah what was your takeaway joey from uh, from worlds uh i actually like you know there's a lot of talk in the world about like is gi dying is no gi the future i thought from an entertainment perspective this was one of the best worlds i've ever watched uh I know I'm not like most people. Like I've watched every major black belt gi match for the last four or five years. Uh, like I watch the matches. Um, you know, sp speaking specifically to that middleweight division, um, I think a lot of people were looking at Ty Rutolo as a you know a favorite to win that. I thought Tainan was going to run over that division. Um, I think, in my opinion, I think Tainan's the best gi practitioner in the world. Um, I did lose a $1 bet to Melissa in the discord for talk jitsu about who would win that division. I thought Ty Dan would take it. Um, she said anyone but Ty Dan and I was wrong. Um, I thought that was a really fun one though. Cause Jansen used a couple of really interesting grips that no one's used on Ty Dan before that just completely shut down his sweeping game from the bottom. And it was interesting to see when he couldn't get that sweeping game that he typically uses going, uh, how it really affected the rest of his game. So I thought that was a really fun match to watch. Um, the lighter weight classes had some, I, I don't want to say necessarily like huge upsets. Obviously, like you said, like all these guys at that level are good and can win on any given day. Like it's not, you can't look at these brackets and go, okay, this guy is going to win. Um, these are all really talented guys. And, you know, a lot of these matches are like one or two advantage wins. Doesn't necessarily mean they're not exciting, though. I mean, especially like the Jansen Gomez Tainan match. Uh, I think it was two advantages for Jansen to zero for Tainan, but that was an exciting match from start to finish. Um, also, uh, we should you know give some props to where it's due. Victor Hugo becomes the first person in like twelve years or something to win the finals of his weight class and the absolute with submissions in both of them. So that's pretty cool. Um, he had a weird double knee bar. I believe it was the absolute division finals. Uh, so you don't get to see that every day at high level black, but that was really cool to watch. Yeah. And sorry, Mike, it's just, okay. just to touch on, uh, a little bit more, um, about the three, um, there's Gomez, there was Rotolo and, uh, Dalpra, like, you know, Gomez won, but doesn't necessarily mean that uh, he's better than them. You know, he won that day and where it mattered for sure. But like one thing that was really interesting, I was talking to uh, a D1 wrestler um, and uh, jo Joseph Bresa, who um, I'm actually going to make a wrestling for jiu-jitsu instructional uh, with, which I'm really excited for. But yeah, he's a D1 wrestler. And one thing he mentioned was like, sometimes people put too much weight on like the all American aspect of, um, you know, like uh, of wrestling. So like what all American means is, is that you were top eight in the country um, for that, for that tournament. Right. And like some of these people got beat by other people um, within like the regular season, but within that specific tournament, they placed top eight. Right. So like, yeah, they're the top eight in the country, but at the same time, um, you know, it's, it's possible for like someone to lose in like the first round or second round that would possibly beat other people that went further than them. Right. So it's like, yeah, it's definitely important to win when it matters, but at the same time, it's like, there's a lot of good guys out there. And uh, yeah, with these three specifically, I think that, uh, yeah, it'd be great to see them compete more in the future. Like I'm not a huge like a uh, fan of watching jujitsu, but I do like, um, yeah, I, I do like that people like watching it and that is an interesting thing for people. But yeah, I think it's just interesting that, um, yeah, there's three really good guys and they could probably beat each other on any different, any given different day. Right. It's just, uh, it, but again, he won when it matters, but yeah, I'd like to see them rematch in the future. Was yeah. there any controversy this year? Did anybody miss the podium uh, uh, pictures or no, I think it was uh, actually like went pretty well that way. I don't think anyone missed their medals or missed had to leave to catch some flights. Yeah. I was wondering um, about that. I just want to jump in to build off what Jordan said. And uh, this is something that like as someone who's raft competed in a lot of different sports, I think is a really important thing to bring up, especially not just for like people competing at worlds or looking to become world champions, but for your average guy competing at the gym or someone who wants to be a competitor, 
uh, different tournament formats select for different things. So when we have these single elimination tournaments, you're looking for who was the best on that day in that given bracket, uh, who matched up the best with their opponents, not knowing who you would face. Uh, things like super fights are looking for who was able to prep for that one specific matchup better and perform better on the day. Um, then you get into other sports that have things like best of seven series. I'm looking for who's the better athlete or team over a given stretch of matches. Um, it's really important for people to understand that just because you lose in a tournament doesn't mean the guy who beat you is necessarily better than you or always going to be better than you, or there's no way in which you beat him. It's just that for that given day on that given tournament, that given format, he was better than you. You could go back in a different format and win. I mean, I've seen a lot now, uh, speaking just of like refing the last couple weekends of round robin tournaments, guys lose one match early in the tournament and they end up winning the division because they win their next four, whereas the guy who beat them went two and two or whatever total. So if it was single elimination, yeah, you lose in the first round, no medal for you sucks, buddy. But just because of the format of the tournament, you know, that's not testing for who's the better, just winning matches, not losing, making it to the finals. It's who's better against everyone in the division. And that guy, you know, maybe he has a style where he takes a lot of risks and he wins a lot, but sometimes he's going to get punished for it. Well, that's not penalized as hard in a round robin format. So it's yeah, important I, for sorry. people who are competing, like just because you lose in a tournament, don't get discouraged and say like, oh, that guy's better than me. I'll never be able to beat him. Just understand that like, he might have had a great day. Like that might have been the day he woke up and ev the stars aligned for this guy. He had the best day of his life. Uh, and it might have been a day you didn't feel great. That doesn't mean that every time you're going to compete against him, you're going to lose or in every format you're going to lose. Even rule sets change things. You know, I beat Jeff has its advantages. ADCC has its no points, period. Um, all these rule sets are different. And sub only is another thing. Like, uh, don't get discouraged because you lost and don't think that someone's necessarily better than you because they beat you in a given format. You know, these things have to play out over time and it's just one match on one day. Yeah. And just to expand on your point, I, I think like one thing that happens commonly is if someone loses to like the gold medal winner. Um, they always take like a, a bit of a moral victory and sometimes it can be an excuse like, Oh, you know, I got matched up against the, the first place guy and, you know, I, I could have done this and that, but sometimes that is true. Sometimes the second, uh, best guy, uh, does lose to the first place guy first round and does not make it onto the podium. And he could have beat uh, everyone else on that podium, or maybe he could beat the other dude in the finals. So like, it's just uh reality and not something we can really uh fix like at the seven series like a seven game series is like definitely a way to do it but it'd be tough to do in jiu-jitsu but uh yeah i agree with your point that just because you got beat doesn't mean that the person's better than you or you can't beat them not that you should like deflect and like not take ownership and uh you know make excuses for yourself but at the same time you know just get better make, and make sure you beat them next time it's like everyone can be beaten never put anyone on the pedestal ever and uh, that's always been my mentality, you know, like if someone ever beat me uh, either in tournament or the gym, I just think like, yeah, you got me now, but I'm going to get you, I'm going to get you later and like in, in the future and you're not gonna be able to do anything to me, uh, you know, at that point, just like you can't get down on yourself. You got to use that uh, feeling like to motivate you to never feel that way again. This is like something I, I like to always talk about, like if you feel bad about something, do everything you can to never feel that way again. Like it's feeling shitty sucks, right? So if you lose, get better, you know, become, get better at jiu-jitsu, get better at competing, get better and work on your cardio, strength and conditioning, everything. Like if you don't want to feel that way, make sure you don't feel that way uh, in the future. So yeah, with that said, um, it's been an hour. It's been a great conversation. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's it. So thank you guys for sticking around to the end of the video. If you're still here, please leave a comment or a fist bump and we'll see you guys next time.